It's a lot of years old. So it's probably the hardest test. Uh, whether or not it is, I don't know. The students usually do fairly well on it. So I don't know if it's because it's not as bad as what they want to make it out to be or if it's because they uh, scare people into believing it's worse than what it is. Or if they scare people enough that you know it actually motivates them to, to study more than what they otherwise would. I don't know. But um, what we're going to do today is we're going to spend most of the day on C-spine. We're not going to do a whole lot on, on T-spine. Um, we'll do T-spine and L-spine next week. What test we have. Um, I think it was Kelsey that told me that spine was not in your uh, information that you picked up from the bookstore, so put it into the, into the module, into uh, Canvas. Uh, PowerPoints. And why I didn't make it into that, I, I don't know. But you should have access to it in your um, in your Canvas. Um, <clears throat> is bony thorax in there? Anybody know? Bony thorax is in there. Canvas. That's okay. Or in your. Uh, I think I posted it as well, but I just uh, wanted to know so that I could. Make sure that that got in there next year. <clears throat> All right, so vertebral column. Uh, we'll talk about um, the C spine primarily today. Again, we'll we'll go through T spine and L spine next week. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, T spine today, but not not just a whole lot. In as much as it pertains to the lower portion of the C spine, we'll talk about T spine. So uh, the vertebral column forms the axial skeleton. It's centered for the most part in mid sagittal plane. Um, you'll have patients sometimes that have scoliosis, which takes it out of the mid sagittal plane. We'll talk about that as well. It is located in the posterior portion of the trunk. In the C, C spine, it's, it's closer to centered, but in the uh, T spine and L spine, it's, it's definitely in the, the posterior portion. The uh, functions are that it encloses and protects the spinal cord, so every vertebra has a hole in it where the spinal cord goes through. It supports the trunk and the skull, and then it provides attachment for muscles, which are, are what all of these pro projections off the posterior portion of the spine are all about. Uh, these things that stick off to the side here, and the things that stick off to the back, back here, just uh, muscular attachments. And we'll talk about the significance of every one of those in the anatomy portion. So, a typical skeleton, uh, we're going to have 33 vertebra, 24 true, movable vertebra, and then the sacral and the coccyx segments are fused into just basically one big bone that we're going to call the sacrum, even though it's individual bones, they're fused together to create sacrum, and the same thing for the coccyx. The coccyx is going to be uh, variable according to, to person, person by person, you may have uh, anywhere from three to five coccyx segments. So they're composed of small irregular bones. Those are your vertebra. There's 33 in early life, 24 being true, and then, and then the rest are fused into two specific segments, being the coccyx and the sacral segments. So they're divided into five groups. So you got cervical, which is the neck, thoracic being the upper portion of the back. You got the lumbar being the lower portion of the back. Then the pelvic segments will be your sacrum and your coccyx. And you have four uh, curvatures, and you can really break those down into, into two different types of curvatures. You got a, a lordotic curvature and a kyphotic curvature. I'm going to spin around, I'm going to kind of draw this on the, the backboard, and we'll talk about how we describe the different ways in which we describe the curvatures. All right, so you're gonna see uh, the, the questions come at you from a couple of different directions. Um, it's either gonna ask you for the lordotic curvature or the kyphotic curvature, um, and where the, the lordotic curvature lives and where the kyphotic curvature lives. And also, it's gonna be asking you, there's some of your questions gonna be asking you about concavity versus convexity, all right? So, just definitions. Um, whenever we talk about chest x-rays, what was lordotic chest x-ray? Yeah. 
Lean it back. Exactly. Lean it back. So think of, of uh, lordotic as, as being a, a leaning back type uh, motion. So kyphotic is you've got a natural kyphotic curvature in your in your T-spine. So when you're doing a, a lateral chest X-ray, you shoot a lateral chest X-ray, what you see is the, the chest and the vertebra kind of bow backwards like that. That's a little bit exaggerated, but you kind of get the point, you know, people are holding on to the bar and you see the, this curvature here, right? That is kyphotic curvature. Sometimes people have compression fractures. Uh, your older patients, especially osteoporotic patients, the, the vertebra will collapse. That's what you call a pathological fracture. It's a fracture because of pathology. The uh, vertebra weakens over time. Cortex of the bone gets thin and they just collapse. So what you'll see in an older patient is an exa exaggerated kyphotic curvature. You've seen older patients, they, they, in their younger life, they walked around you know, with good posture and the older in life they got, the, the more they slunched over, right? It's an exaggerated kyphotic curvature. So the T-spine is a kyphotic curvature. The L-spine goes in the opposite direction. It's as if you were leaning back and that is your lordotic curvature. So T-spine, kyphotic, and uh, L-spine is lordotic. Okay, so that takes care of two of them. Those are the most obvious two. But it starts to go back around in the pelvis so that your coccyx is pointing kind of anteriorly so what you've got is a return to kyphosis in the uh, sacrum, in the sacral segments. And then when we get back up into the C-spine, what you've got is a return to lordosis. Okay, so your questions will ask, you know, what, what curvatures are Lordotic, you know, that would be your C-spine and your L-spine. Which curvature is a kyphotic? That would be your sacrum or your pelvic segments and your, your T-spine, a kyphotic, all right? So the other way that it'll ask you is which one's convex and which one is concave. Well, first off, you gotta get some perspective because both are both. Kyphotic curvatures are both convex and concave depending on which perspective you're looking at. So when we're talking about convex, um, you know, just word association, whenever you flex your muscle, you know, you flex your muscle, what, what do you get? Does it dent? No, it bulges. So you flex and it bulges outward, right? So you flex your muscles and it bulges outward. So you got a bulge here, 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 right? So the, the head is up here and the nose is pointing that way. So what's anterior? This side and what's posterior? That side, right? So the C spine, where is the bulge on the C spine? Anterior. anterior, right. So anteriorly, we've got convex, right? And on the L spine, anteriorly, we have convex, right? The T spine, posteriorly, is convex. And then the sacrum and the coccyx posteriorly is convex. Okay? So your question may ask, uh, you know, your C-spine is convex on which surface? That would be the, your anterior surface. The T-spine is convex on which surface? That would be your posterior surface. That's not enough. We've also got concave. So again, word association. You got a mountain. You got a hole in the mountain. What do we call it? the hole in the mountain? You can walk into it and you can go spelunking. What do you call it? A cave. A cave, right. So caves go in, right? So the C spine is concave posteriorly and it is uh, convex anteriorly. The T spine is concave anteriorly. The L spine is concave posteriorly. posteriorly. And these, uh, the pelvic segments are concave anterior. Okay? So
So two of those curvatures are in response to stimulus. Two of those curvatures are primary. Okay, you are born with this curve and this curve. All right, so you look at a baby, you look at a baby, uh, you're probably never gonna see a baby's uh, lateral T-spine and L-spine. You know, you're just not gonna see it. But you look at a baby crawling around and what you'll see is their back is straight, right? Uh, you get up on your hands and knees, chances are you're gonna have a little bit of sag in your back. So what you're born with is your T-spine curvature and your sacral uh, segment curvature. You don't get a C-spine curvature and you don't get an L-spine curvature until you stand up. And the weight uh, causes that, the weight of your head causes a C-spine curve, the weight of the rest of your body causes your L-spine curvature. So you got two primary curvatures, that would be these two, and you've got two secondary curvatures, and that would be these two, okay? So a lot of stuff, you know, uh, that really kind of goes into this one slide to keep in mind. Convexity, concavity, uh, primary curvatures, secondary curvatures, all of that you have to know for the test. So you got the vertebra here, the big blocky thing, then you got the disc in between. This thing down here is supposed to represent a herniated disc. All right? So you've heard of people saying, well, I got a herniated disc, and you've heard other people say, I've got a slip disc. Right? And they're the same thing. It's kind of like the difference between a fracture and a broken bone. They're the same thing. Um, what happens there is that the disc is made up, you can almost think of it kind of like a, a, a textbook or a phone book. So you've got individual little bitty pieces of fibrous stuff that go together to create the book, right? But imagine your book having some, like some jello on the inside of it. Jello is not going to come out until some of those pages are torn, right? So you tore, tearing up those pages and some of the goo that's inside the book comes out. And that's uh, basically a slip disc. You know, where the, the analogy fails is that that doesn't just leak out into the peritoneum. It's, it's just this goo that is still attached and we got to do something with it. So it's separated by the intervertebral discs and they act as cushions uh, so that you don't have bone on bone. So the disc is composed of the annulus fibrosus, which is the outer portion, and then you've got the nucleus pulposus, which is the inner portion. So a herniated disc is where you've got a tear of that annulus fibrosus and some of the nucleus pulposus is coming out. And it's really not all that big of, of, of a problem until it becomes a problem. So what you've got is a disc that's going around all the way through in between the, the individual vertebrae. So if you've got a slip disc and it's pushing straight out front, then it's not pushing on anything. It's pushing on abdominal contents. Big deal. you got water pushing on water. It's really not all that big of a deal. And what this is trying to show is that if it's pushing back towards where it would mash a nerve right up against the bone, now you got a problem, right? Um, because the, the nerve needs blood flow, and if you compromise blood flow or stimulate that nerve, then you're going to have some pain. And a pain in a lot of cases is not going to be at the point of, of pressure um, because that nerve is receiving signals all the way down from your feet and your toes. So what a patient may experience, depending on where, the, and how, where and how the nerve is stimulated, what the patient may experience is not pain here, but pain somewhere else. So you've heard of phantom pain, right? Somebody loses their leg and still their foot itches. 
Well, the reason for that is because the nerve is still intact, proximal to where the, the amputation was. So the nerve still thinks the foot's there, right? So if that nerve proximal to where the foot was gets stimulated, like an itch on a, on a foot, the patient will experience an itchy foot even though the itch isn't there. Kind of the same principle here. So if you get a mash of that nerve here, then the patient may have numbness in their toes or pain in their, their leg as opposed to actual pain you know, at, at the point of, of compression of the nerve. It's real weird. And we can predict where the patient's um, likely compromised nerve is based on what their, their pain is. You know, if they're hurting on toes two, three, and four, then it's probably going to be at one level. If it's one and two, it may be at a, a different level altogether. So, uh, just a you know graphic of, of how the, the curvatures look. We got seven cervical. We've got twelve thoracic. Typically, we're going to have five lumbar. Typically, we're going to have five sacral segments, and then we'll have anywhere from three to five coccyx segments. Probably the most common deviation of this. Uh, not counting the, the sacral segments, are two things. One is, in a lot of cases, you'll see a patient with only four lumbar vertebrae. And it's an incidental finding. They had no clue that they had four lumbar vertebrae. And uh, once in a while, you have a patient who has small ribs that stick off of the seventh cervical vertebra. You've got 12 thoracic vertebrae, one for every rib. So you should have 12 sets of ribs. But uh, some patients, it's pretty rare. I don't know that I've personally ever seen it, uh, but it's common enough that it makes its way into every uh, textbook. And that is that sometimes patients will have what we call cervical ribs. And cervical rib, cervical ribs, um, in a lot of cases, the patient will have some, some upper extremity issues um, just because of the compromise or the compression of the nerve because of the ribs. So those two common very common, um, or somewhat common, um, uh, spinal deviations. Probably the most common, the most common one that I see, though, is what we call a transitional vertebra. Now, a transitional vertebra, uh, the cervical ribs is an example of transitional vertebra, but what you're going to see more often is uh, what you'll have is uh, T, I'm sorry, L5, rather takes on the appearance of a sacral segment, but you've still got a, um, a disc there. So it's not really a sacral segment, it is L5, but it takes on the appearance of the sacral segment. So it's, it's got a very sharp curvature to it, or a, a very a sharp wedge shape to it. So that's one. And number two is that sometimes you'll see uh, L5 anterior to the anterior alignment of L5-S1. In other words, L5 will be sticking out here somewhere. Again, incidental finding in most cases is what we call spondylolisthesis, And most of the time, the patient's not gonna have any kind of problems with it. And it is an incidental finding, it just looks awful. It looks like what we call subluxation. Subluxation is where we've got one vertebra that slides um, anterior to the other vertebra. It's not a problem because our spinal cord actually ends right up here L5 or I'm sorry L1 L2 it ends relatively high you still do have the thecal sac below that you, you've got individual nerves that come out in between the vertebra but the spinal cord itself is no longer existent all the way down here so you don't have any kind of paralysis with spondylolisthesis the patient doesn't have any kind of problems and again, it's, it's what we call incidental finding. It's something that we didn't expect to see, and it's not a, truly a problem for the patient. It's just that we happened to, to find something we hadn't expected to see. So typical vertebra, it's a typical vertebra. We've got some that are normally atypical, uh, atypical, but we've got a body. We've got a vertebral arch posteriorly. The body is anterior. So the two parts enclose a space that we call the, uh, the vertebral foramen. You're going to have a tendency to confuse the vertebral foramen with the intervertebral foramen. The vertebral foramen 
is the big hole where the spinal cord goes through. Vertebral, one vertebra. One vertebra, one hole, and the, the spinal cord goes through it. The intervertebral foramina are the holes where you've got two different um, vertebrae coming together to create the hole, okay? So if it's intervertebral, that means two. If it's vertebral, it just means one. We've got vertebral foramina where the uh, spinal cord passes through all the vertebrae. All right, so the vertebral arch is formed by two pedicles, two lamina, and then you've got uh, the uh, articular processes that project off of and around the vertebral arch. So we're going back to the backboard again. We're going to draw that out. Somebody's gonna get sick watching this. All right. Tighten down. Doesn't want to tighten. So the spinous process comes up and it joins the vertebra and it goes anteriorly and laterally. And when it gets out lateral, just almost straight lateral, depending on which vertebra we're looking at, it goes uh, outward again and it creates what we call the uh, transverse because it's projecting out transversely. And then those go anterior, they go back towards midline, and then they go anterior, and off of the, an uh, off of the anterior of that, we create the body. Okay, so what we have posterior to the body is the ver vertebral foramen. So what we have here is what we call the lamina. The lamina is where the transverse processes come back to meet with the uh, spinous process, that's the lamina. Up here, what we have is, you know, again, word association, what we have is what we call the pedicle. Okay? So you can think of the pedicle as what's holding the body up. So word association, if you have something that you really like to take care of, uh, something that you, you really want to display, you put it up on a pedestal. Exactly. So pedicle Kind of what the body hold, uh, is, is kind of what the body holds up. I just drew the vertebra for the elephant man, apparently. And what we've got is here the intervertebral disc. So that if the intervertebral disc, we get a, a rupture of the disc and it pushes back there, then what we've got is fluid filled structures being pushed up against bone. You can't compress fluid, uh, it just doesn't compress. Can you see? Okay. Okay, so you, you can't compress fluid. So the problem is that whenever we have uh, an attempt to compress fluid, what we have is displacement. Okay, so you eat a great big meal and you lay down on your belly. You overate at a buffet, you lay down on your belly. What, uh, what, do you, what, what kind of sensations do you feel? Can you breathe well? Most of the time, no. Okay, so what happens there is you lay down on your stomach and all that fluid uh, that is, makes up your abdominal cavity plus all the food and the, the drink that you had mashes up and it, it's got to go somewhere so it pushes your diaphragm up and you can't breathe real well. So here, if the disc slips back and it mashes into the, the spinal cord, then what's going to happen is the spinal cord that might be shaped like that 
If it continues to mesh, what's going to happen is the spinal cord is going to be pushed into the bone. And then, of course, again, we've got some problems with uh, compromised nerves. So what they'll do, anybody been to surgery? Nobody's been to surgery yet? Okay. Okay. Um, lumbar laminectomy where they were working on the back. Did y'all see that? You will eventually if you haven't. So what they do is, uh, in some cases, they'll, they'll fuse vertebrae together. They'll go in and actually take the disc out, completely remove the disc and, and fuse a couple of bones. But sometimes a, a uh, kind of a stopgap type thing that's a less invasive surgery than a, a spinal fusion that might get them through is to relieve some of the pressure just by cutting a portion of the, the uh, lamina out so that the vertebrae can actually bulge out that way a little bit. That's what we we'll call a lumbar laminectomy. And the purpose for that is, is kind of to relieve the pressure in the event the patient has a bulging disc that's mashing on the spine and causing some problems. Okay, so spinous process, transverse processes, body, you know, where all those come together, we create the vertebral foramen. And the individual portions of the posterior arch would be, we've got the, the pedicle, which is just posterior to the body, and the lamina, which is where the, the, uh, the space in between the transverse processes and the uh, spinous processes, okay? Also, with those, what we have is joint spaces. So the vertebra don't just articulate at the at the um, it's going to make me insane. Don't just articulate at the disc space, but you've actually got some bony joint spaces in there as well. Okay. So can you see? That line right there, and there, and there. Can you, can you kind of make those out? If not, I can pass this out. But you've got articulations here. These are actually cartilaginous articulations, and it's what we call a facet joint, also known as a zygopophyseal joint. Zygopophyseal is, is the more accepted facet, was what we called it for a long time. They changed it to zygopophyseal. Actually, they changed it to apophyseal, and then they added zyg in front of that, so that's zygopophyseal joint. So if you've ever known anybody that had uh, arthritis in their neck or in their back and they needed facet injections, that's what they're doing is they're injecting some steroids into that joint space to relieve some of the, the pain in that joint space, inherent in the joint space. So what you've got there on each vertebra is a superior and inferior joint space. So back here you've got uh, on this, uh, this, this would be C, you got C1, C2, so you got C2, 3. So you've got a superior articular process, and then you've got an inferior articular process. So the superior articular process articulates with the inferior articular process of the vertebra directly above it. So that what you've got is vertebra with a, a, a facet joint, or facet, and then you've got another one and they articulate together. So this is the inferior articular process of the vertebra on top, and this is a superior articular process of the one on bottom, and they come together like that, okay? So you've got um, four of those on each vertebra. So you've got the two on top, two on bottom. Superior articular processes and inferior articular processes. Uh, every type of exam that we're gonna talk about, uh, C-spine, T-spine, and L-spine, each one of those is going to ask you for two different things. On which view do we see the facet joint? On which view do we see the zygopophyseal joint? Or on which view do we see the, uh, the intervertebral foramina, which is a foramina created by the articulation of two vertebrae that come together. So the nerves come out of the intervertebral foramina, right? whereas the, the joint space itself is the zygopophyseal joint. So C-spine, we're going to see these on specific views and these on specific views, but they're going to be different. 
On the T-spine, we're going to see these on specific views and these on specific views, but they're going to be different. The same thing with the L-spine. Right. So pedicles project posteriorly. Bottom is concave to form the vertebral notches, um, and the two vertebral notches from the vertebra above and below come together to create the inner vertebral foramen. And the foramen is where the nerves come off. Again, the foramen is where the spinal cord passes through. The vertebral foramen is where the spinal cord passes through. The inner vertebral foramen is where the nerves come off of the spinal cord and eventually go down into the extremities wherever it is that they need to go. So the lamina project posteriorly from the pedicles uh, towards the, the spinal process. So um, we talked about the transverse processes um, and the spinal process. Spina bifida is a condition where the posterior arch doesn't completely heal up or it doesn't completely seal up. It's not that it's unhealed, it's just that it is unsealed. It should be fused eventually, but sometimes instead of coming together, you know, the posterior arch where they go like this, what they do is it's like they miss and they go like that. And most of your patients who have spina bifida don't even know it. Uh, spina bifida is a congenital condition you're either going to have it or you don't, and uh, different textbooks say different things, but uh, there's a condition called spina bifida occulta. Uh, it's like occult, uh, you know, uh, like you're in a cult, uh, but with an A after it. But anyway, that's a asymptomatic spina bifida that you, somebody in this class probably has it and you have no clue. Uh, a significant portion of the population, maybe, I don't know, different textbooks say different things, but maybe as many as 20% of the population has it. I might have it. I don't know. But it's asymptomatic. You, you'll live your life without even knowing it. Where it becomes a problem is if that separation between those two portions of the posterior arch are so great that a portion of the spinal cord comes out and the fecal sac comes out, that's when you have problems with spina bifida. Okay, so spina bifida occulta is no big deal. Spina bifida, true spina bifida, what we consider, what we think about when we think of spina bifida, uh, most likely the patients, uh, there's a very good chance that, that there would be, uh, if you had a spina bifida patient, paraplegic, right? So uh, don't be surprised if, if you happen to see somebody it just is a walkie-talkie patient that comes in. Somebody says, yeah, they got spine bifida. Most of the time, it's no big deal. So we talked about this. Those are your articular processes. Again, you've got body. You've got pedicle. you got a, uh, if this is the superior aspect, that will be your um, superior articular process. you got transverse process. you got posterior arch with the lamina. Yeah, you got uh, the uh, spinous process. From the side, we've got the, the facet. Notice it says facet. Uh, facet is just a, a place to receive something else. And usually, you, you don't see facet except for in two different places. Most of the time that we're talking about facets, we're going to see facet mentioned in only two places. And that is in the spine, really only one place. That's in the spine but specific to articulation between the spines, uh, the spinal vertebra, but also you got a facet out here. Now, every type of vertebra are gonna have distinguishing markings to them, okay? So we've got a, a, a facet way out here on the, the uh, transverse process, and uh, that's unique to one specific portion of the vertebral column. We've got a facet here that articulates with the inferior articular process of the next vertebra to create the intervertebral arch. But we got this weird little facet right here and a facet right there. Okay? And what those are specific to is the T spine. So, what do the T spine vertebra articulate with that no other, unless you have, you know, this transitional vertebra in the cervical spine? 
what do they uh, articulate with that no other portion of the spine does? Ribs. Ribs, right. So that's a rib facet is what those are. Uh, so the rib touches the body and it also touches transverse process. So what's unique to the T-spine is that. So if you see on the test a vertebra and it says, what kind of vertebra is this? And you see those two funky little spots right there, you know that that is only one type of vertebra. And that would be the T-spine, T-spine, L-spine. T-spine. T-spine vertebra, right. All right, so uh, cervical vertebra, we've got seven. They occupy the neck. The unique features of the C-spine is that they've got a transverse foramina located in the transverse process. This is not the same as the intervertebral foramen. What we've got in the C-spine is blood supply that goes through the vertebra itself. You see this red thing right there? It's supposed to be representative of the vertebral artery. It goes up into the, the brain. All right, so you've got, since you've got that blood flow going directly through the transverse process, you've got to have a hole in the transverse process for the blood supply to go through it, right? So if you're looking at a vertebra, again, and you're looking at the superior inferior aspect of it, and it's got a hole in a little bitty tiny transverse process, it's only going to be one type of vertebra that has that hole in the transverse process, and that would be a C-spine vertebra, right? The other thing is that on the posterior portion, you probably can't see this from uh, where you are, but on the posterior portion, on the, tran on the, uh, the uh, spinous process, you've got uh, a split. So snake has a, a tongue, it's bifid, it's forked, right? The, the um, spinous process on C-spine vertebra are also bifid, so that they, you know, acute flexion and extension, you can get a little bit more extension uh, if they're a little bit split. So two things that are gonna be specific about C-spine vertebra, one is that transverse foramina, but the other is that the spinous process is gonna be split. So just right at the end, it splits and it's bifid. So you got two in the C-spine that are truly unique. Uh, C1 is called the Atlas. In Greek mythology, the god carries the world around on his shoulders. That's his, his name is the Axis. All right, so C1 is the Atlas, or I'm sorry, the Atlas. Uh, C1 is the Atlas, it carries the head, all right? And then the Axis is C2. And the reason we call the Axis C2 is because it's got kind of like a, a uh, the book says it's like a tooth-like projection off the anterior portion of the body. And it's what we call the odontoid process. So it sticks up, and what you've got is the ring of C1 that fits right over the top of it so that you can pivot your head. Whenever you turn your head, most of that pivot comes between C1 and C2. You get a little bit of a turn uh, between different vertebrae, but most of that pivot comes from C1, C2. So that's where the, the turn comes from, is uh, all the way up to C1, C2. C7 is also atypical uh, in that it's got a great big long spinous process. So if you feel the back of your neck, that knot on the back of your neck, that what you're actually feeling is what we call the vertebral prominence. Because it's prominent, it's that knot on the back of your neck is, is what you're feeling is the spinous process of C7. So what's unique about C1 is it has an anterior arch, it's got a posterior arch, it's got two lateral masses, and we'll talk about lateral masses later on. And we've got two transverse processes, but it has no vertebral body. It really doesn't have a body. What, what you'll see in the textbook, the drawing in the textbook, is it's a little bit expanded on the, on the front, but it really doesn't have a body itself. All right, so it also has superior articular processes to articulate with the condyles of the skull. So on the bottom of the skull, oh, here. Wow. I'll let it drop some of that and break it. The bottom of the skull, you've got these two condyles right here, and they articulate with C1, all right? So 
Uh, you've got articulate process Kallax facets on the, the top of C1 to articulate with the bottom of the skull. So again, uh, off the front, you've got the dens of the odontoid process. So the unique thing about C2 is it's got a massive body and off for its size. It's got a massive body and with that body, it's got C1 so that it receives the, or the, the odontoid process. Uh, sticks up through C1, uh, so you, you've got kind of an axle type thing going on there uh, so that you can rotate that. So C1, again, uh, you've got this little bulge here, but you really fundamentally have no body. Uh, the posterior arch is very large and, and really a, a portion of the brain stem sticks through there. You've got superior articular uh, facets for the skull. And then you've got transverse foramen, um, whereas on C2, you've got the adenoid process, the lateral masses, it's just a big glob of, of uh, tissue out to the side, or not tissue, but bone out to the side. Okay, now notice you've got a transverse ligament, and this is labeling the adenoid process, and it may occupy a little bit more room in the, the um, in the anterior portion of the arch. But the, the significance of pointing out this transverse ligament is that sometimes, uh, you know, we can have clinically broken bones without having a fracture, especially in, in the spine. So if a patient ruptures this ligament and it can happen, then again, clinically the patient has a broken neck. Uh, this ligament, the purpose for this ligament is to keep the odontoid process in the anterior portion of the arch. So since you've got the, the spine right back here, if you don't have this ligament or this ligament tears, then what you've got is basically, you know, you, your, your C-spine and your odontoid process can bump into your spine. Not a good situation to be in, right? So some of the uh, exams that we take, it's vitally important to position properly so that we can evaluate the relationship to the odontoid as to where it's going to be or where it should be. We'll talk about that when we get into uh, broken necks here in a bit. So again, uh, C7 is your vertebral prominence. You can easily palpate that. Uh, typical vertebra, you've got the superior articular process. Again, you've got transverse foramen. You've got the bifid spinous process. Uh, vertebral foramen, or uh, vertebral foramen, and then you've got the, the arches. You got a, um, a very high arch on the uh, bottom portion of one, a very low arch in the uh, top portion of another, and those come together to create the intervertebral foramen. Right. We'll go about five minutes, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so patient preparation, um, with a C-spine, what, what you need to do is, uh, if, if your patient's not in a collar and you can, you want to take the, uh, any necklaces off of the patient, or take any earrings out. If the patient's got any kind of uh, dentures, you ask them to pull those out as well. You're going to have a, a problem sometimes um, if the patient's in a collar. And if the patient's in a collar, uh, digging down to get to the earrings, digging uh, around to get to the, uh, to the necklace, if the patient has a high likelihood of having some sort of cervical injury, probably pretty counterproductive, uh, counter um, you know, because if you start digging around into the patient's collar trying to get their earrings, somebody starts poking on the side of your head, what are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to have a tendency to move your head a little bit, and if they've got a cervical injury, Probably not a good thing to do, right? So sometimes you'll have to make a judgment call. If you've truly got a trauma and they suspect that the patient has a broken neck, then you're probably going to leave that stuff on or have somebody else take it off, have the, the uh, ER doc remove the collar and take that stuff off if it absolutely has to come off. But if the patient can, you want to remove all that stuff. Um, most of your uh, positions, uh, are, are going to be subjective and uh, different texts will shoot in different orientations whether they're upright or laying down if they're a walkie-talkie patient uh, I do a little bit of a hybrid um, some of the 
the exams or some of the views I'll shoot with the patient upright and some with the patient laying down just because I get better outcome off of it. Your image receptor size, your column and field, uh, for the most part, it's never going to be for the C-spine larger than 10 by 12. And really, the 12 inch length is pretty standard, but you can collimate in uh, so that you don't include, you know, you don't overexpose the patient. You can collimate side to side. So instead of 10 by 12, maybe 8 by 12. SID is going to be according to which exam we're going to shoot. Some are going to be at 40 inches, some are going to be at 72 inches. Always mark your markers, uh, your radiation protection. It's going to be hard to, to use radiation protection. You can put a, a gown on a patient, but it needs to be below the shoulders because of, that lead in the shoulders will show up. And patient instructions, most of the time it's just going to be exhalation, but uh, some of the views we're going to have the patient do some, by the book, uh, certain things, and we'll talk about those. So earrings, necklaces, any kind of clothing artifact need to come off the patient. Um, some upright, some with the patients laying down. If it's a trauma patient, obviously you're not going to stand the patient up. You're not even going to move the patient if it's a true trauma patient. So well, we'll go ahead and take a break there, and then we'll come back and uh, get into the uh, rest of the information. I want to see. Let's take 10 minutes and then we'll pick up from there.